Uh, so, uh, it's very nice to be here. I'm, uh, I've not been to the RL UK conference before. Uh, I arrived uh, just before lunch, actually, and I bumped into Mark at the back of the room, and he said to me, we meet again. Because <laughs> we had uh, sort of been on a debate for a panel back at Imperial at the end of September, and uh, it felt a little bit like an encounter in a Bond film. You'll notice that I've subtly cast myself in the role of Bond. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we should look on Mark as Goldfinger or anyone like that. But if I can extend the analogy, perhaps, you know, to Michael Barrett's Q, uh, can sort of provide some of the resources to the agents in the field, as it were. Uh, but they can still have a slightly prickly relationship sometimes, but at least they can talk to one another. And Perhaps if I dare to extend even further, uh, and Janet might take on the role of Anne. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all on the same side, uh, but we all have different perspectives on things. And so uh, I see my remit here actually as just trying to get the researchers' perspectives. And I know many of you as librarians unfortunately have to deal with people like me, uh, academics and researchers. I won't, I won't defend my profession in any, in any shape or form, but uh, let me try and give you my view. So um, I, I, I really like this picture uh, because I think it, you know, it's worth a thousand words and I think it symbolizes quite well uh, what we're about here. We're trying to build something that's never been built before. And so we don't quite know how to do it perhaps. And the weather and the climate looks a bit uncertain, perhaps a bit threatening even. And so uh, uh, there's an awful lot sort of up for play, shall we say. And I think that affects uh, all the stakeholders uh, involved in this uh, messy business of open access. So uh, it's kind of a coup for me, I think, to be here. I'm just a blogger, right? But I'm here in a session with uh, Dave Janet Bench, uh, the head of open access policy at the RCUK. I am uh, a life scientist, that's my sort of day job, uh, but uh, I kind of got into this really because I started writing about open access back in January really, and I, I haven't actually stopped since, uh, or stopped yet, I could uh, bore from Britain I think on the topic, um, and I've even sort of uh, sometimes write about it in the Guardian as well, though not on that particular occasion. Simon Jackers does get up my name sometimes. <laughs> but, um, I, it's kind of been a personal journey for me, and uh, you know, Dame Janet conceded that she didn't know much about open access before starting the report. I, you know, I was aware of it, of course. Uh, I was aware of the policy of the RTK from 2006 and of the Wellcome Trust, and uh, <coughs> I used to apply for funding. Um, but I, you know, I didn't. It was one of those things that was a sort of secondary consideration. You really thought about it, you know, after you had your paper accepted, and you kind of tried to remind yourself, well, like, what, what am I? What is it I'm supposed to do? And you may or may not have you know, bothered to, 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 get, to get on with it. But uh, what, what got me started on it, and got me writing about it really, was discovering uh, about the Research Works Act back in January, which is a piece of US legislation, now dead of course. Uh, but it was the wording of that legislation, and this is more like, it's about half of the act, but it's uh, no federal agency may engage in any policy that causes network dissemination of any private sector research work without the prior consent of the publisher. Now that sounds relatively innocuous, relatively that's reasonable, isn't it? But it's when you finally realize that private sector research work means public sector research work that the text becomes, takes on a rather different hue. And this was sponsored, had uh, apparently cross-party support, but also it was uh, Carolyn Mahoney is from New Jersey or New York, and there are publishing interests there, and they were making donations to her campaign, and uh, they may even have helped to draft the policy. I'm not entirely sure, but certainly there were noises in that direction. And it was a bit of a wake-up call um, for me. And um, my reaction really was about this, it did seem like a bit of a land grab. I mean, I have obviously been you know, working in academia for 20 years or so, so I kind of was aware of the relationship that we have as academics with the uh, publishing industry, but it was this idea that it was their content. Now, I realized that I had blithely been handing over my copyright for years and years, and so uh, I was a fool, of course, in all this. But I think that you know, open access creates an opportunity to renegotiate that relationship, and I think uh, publishers obviously need to be uh, aware of that, and I think they are. Uh, 
more aware of it now, thanks to the good work of Elsevier in helping to support this legislation. <laughs> so, I was also starting to become informed. I, I met my chief of librarian services for the first time this year. I was horrified to discover the sorts of budgets that are being deployed in order to cover um, subscription costs, and then the fact that some of these uh, big deal agreements are shrouded in confidentiality of uh, clauses, which meant that she couldn't even tell me uh, how much we pay for uh, some companies products. So given that you know many of these companies like to think that they have a good working relationship with the academic community, then that didn't actually seem to be panning out in reality quite. And you know, as an academic, I'm really quite proud of our you know amateur status. I know it's professional, I know I get paid for this, I work at a university, but there is still a sort of uh, a strong amateur uh, ethos I think within academia. We do share Papers, we share the agents, many of us do, some, some people are badly behaved and aren't so good at that. And so it was very much rubbing up against this idea that you know, there are commercial tensions, and while of course we deal with commercial organizations all the time, there is a very particular aspect to the relationship with publishers because we provide so much of the product uh, that they then regard as their private property, both in terms of writing it, doing the research that leads to it, and then of course uh, the whole business of peer review. So um, things are changing, though. It's been a very interesting and exciting year, I think, for anyone uh, looking in. Uh, of course, uh, the academic journal is a fantastic uh, concept. It was a great idea when it was first introduced uh, in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, whether or not it's still a great idea, I think, is now a topic for serious uh, debate. <coughs> because, as we know, as Janet said, the web changes everything. This glorious moment of the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games in London earlier this summer when Tim Berners Lee uh, made a star appearance. And it really was, you know, the, as much as the sort of you know, the opening ceremony of the Olympics, I think, made us look at Britain in a new light, and I think in a very positive light, then I think uh, the, the introduction of the World Wide Web is just shaking everything up. So we have to engage with that and I do pay credit to the uh, UK government for the action that it has taken and I, I take on board the, the fact that they have a transparency agreement. I'm, I'm not a natural conservative uh, voter. Um, I'm not a natural conservative voter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah, credit where it's due to uh, David Willits in a speech that he made um, back in March or April, I think actually to the publishing industry where you know, they down the law you know, to try to preserve the old model. It's the wrong matter to fight. Things have moved on. And as Dame Janet put it very eloquently in her report, uh, the principle that publicly funded results should be publicly available is fundamentally unanswerable. And I don't think anybody seriously disagrees with its uh, policy statements now. The question really for us now is how do we uh, engage with that? So for academics, it's quite problematic in many ways. Uh, you know, we're supposed to be clever and techy and whatnot, but you know, anything to do with the web seems to be a bit of a challenge for us. And I think on all sides, even the librarians, I think we have to recognize that it is complicated. So, open access, of course, uh, many of you know this already, but it's, it's a done deal, I think, in terms of the intellectual and the moral um, argument. It's an inevitable consequence of the internet. We have this technology, let's just see how much we can do with it. It's going to make things uh, better. In terms of public policy then, I think it's uh, very obviously, but uh, it's always good to then dig in and find the evidence for this. I think some work needs still to be done in that direction, but it looks like a good investment, good value for money for the taxpayer, and a fair deal for the taxpayer who's paying for this work and has every right to be able to get access to it. It is horrendously confusing. I've been writing about it for uh, nine months or more. I've written an awful lot of words about it, and I still don't feel that I've quite mastered the topic. Uh, so I do wonder and feel sympathy then for many of my colleagues for whom it still remains a sort of back burner issue, uh, something that I haven't entirely engaged with yet. And of course, then, it's a big challenge for everybody involved in it, not just for publishers who see uh, well, lucrative industry facing you know, particular commercial pressures. Uh, learned societies have particular worries about income streams from journals. Uh, we 
which of course then leads on to fund any worthwhile academic activities, particularly perhaps for young scientists. For funders as well, how do they negotiate that? I'm sure Mark feels that acutely. Uh, for us academics, and then of course for librarians who have for now probably are charged, I think, with helping to implement uh, the nuts and bolts of the RCBK policy and any other policy developments that come from other uh, publicly funded bodies, plus the local trust as well. Open access is not, there's an awful lot of words written by many people. Um, uh, there's an awful lot of misinformation out there, some of it accidental due to ignorance, some of it not accidental due to particular interest groups having their point of view, but it's, sim it's not free, it's not the same thing as file sharing. I don't think anybody seriously contends that it is, although uh, analogies are sometimes drawn with the music industry, but it's very much not that because the producer and consumer, the researcher, are often one and the same person, and that's not the same in other, uh, most other industries, even if they're based on the web. It's not the end of peer review. I know there are some in the vanguard who say that you know you should basically type it into your lab book and it should immediately appear on your Twitter feed. Uh, I'm not in favor of that particular mode of scientific communication. It would seem to me to add unnecessarily to the verbiage. I, I appreciate the value of a good filter. Uh, and I appreciate that I have a bit of forethought as well, uh, even among researchers. So I'm not really in the open science vanguard, although uh, obviously openness is a very good thing, but uh, openness without career suicide is, is, is my, is my <laughs> It's not synonymous with low quality, but sometimes I charge flung at some of the mega journals that are, have appeared and that have actually worked quite well uh, to develop a sustainable model based on open access publishing. And another chart is often made, and I, one can understand where this views come, it's not just for uh, wealthy life scientists who you know, perhaps can tap into funds from the Balkan Trust who led a very particular model of open access, which we've seen now has been replicated in part, although perhaps not with the topics quite as deep uh, as the public demand research. So, if everybody thinks it's a good idea, or at least most people think it's a good idea, why aren't we there yet? Well, uh, there are problems, I think, on all sides. For publishers, of course, they have long resisted um, open access. Many of them have, not, not entirely all. Um, some voices at the scholarly kitchen, I don't know if it's a blog that many people read. Uh, I try not to read it these days, it just gets on the goat. But uh, uh, there are some interesting things there occasionally. But obviously, you know, it's been good money, uh, surprisingly good money for some. We've discovered uh, this year uh, profit margins that uh, even best Apple computers, who one might regard as a highly innovative company, um, although uh, with reprehensible tax avoidance strategies, I have to say, although some publishers I gather. Uh, have a like approach to uh, contributing to the public coffers. Uh, so, hence the insistence on copyright acquisition, which, you know, we simply have handed over without thinking about it, and I'm as guilty of this uh, as anybody uh, in my career. Uh, hence we get, you know, support lobbying for the Research Works Act. Who knows what other pieces of legislation they have lobbied for or lobbied against. Uh, one, I think, has to be mindful of. Uh, you know, they are acting in their own interests. They are, uh, they're entirely entitled to do so, uh, of course, as a free agent in a free society, but we have to be aware uh, of what they might be up to. And the business of confidentiality clauses shows that, you know, they are hard-nosed business organizations. Um, acting rationally, that's fine, but uh, there are more than, there's more than one actor in this business. So other publishers are more forward-thinking, I would say, and, okay, I've hammered Elsevier a lot, uh, but it's not all bad there, I think. Uh, I discovered their open archives uh, this week, which uh, provides free access to some of their uh, background, uh, uh, back catalogue of materials, some of it as, as, as recently as 12 months ago. So that's not quite good enough for open access, but it's uh, much better than nothing. So I will give credit where it's due. I'd like to think that I'm a fair minded uh, individual. But, of course, we've seen some very interesting developments from uh, publishing houses, some of them that have sprung out from the academic community, and I'm very interested to see sort of more of these coming out. So PLOS, obviously, is a, uh, a big one now, effectively a profit organization. Most of the profits are coming, of course, then from PLOS One, but that allows them then to maintain a stable of uh, more selective journals with particular remits. Uh, Biomed Central is another one, 
we're seeing its emergence only this year, actually, of several new uh, publishing ventures. E9, in particular, has, has come out looking to sort of target the uh, high end of the market. PeerJ is uh, more in plus territory, but pitching itself with a much, uh, a potentially much more affordable model, which relies on essentially a sort of membership fee from authors, which is pitched at uh, $99. Or there are, there's a sliding scale. Uh, but that's, they haven't launched yet, but uh, that's their funding model. It's run by Peter Denfield, who came from PLOS, so I imagine he knows what he's doing. So that's something to look out for for interest. And then the Frontiers uh, operation is another one that I've become aware of recently, which has an interesting model uh, where it's a bit like a mega journal, so the, the, the criteria is for is the science sound, is the research sound, then we'll publish it. They're not really worried about uh, impact agendas, but then actually after they've published the paper, uh, they, they look at the interest that's generated by each one in terms of metrics, and then they, for the top 10% or so, they will write to the authors and say, you know, you're one of our top 10% papers, would you like to write a, a review article that puts the work in context? And that helps to get more uh, attention and adds more value, I think, to the work, so that's an interesting development. So I think we're going to see lots of innovation there. Very much hope so. And it's certainly a market that was in need of a shakeup. So, other potential impediments uh, funders and government policies. Have they been too meek? Uh, are they still too meek? So, certainly pre this year, then I think uh, Mark was uh, good enough to uh, be honest about the point really was that there was a policy, it has been around since 2006, but really uh, lackluster enforcement. And that has resulted in low uptake. I don't think we even know uh, what the level of uptake is from our UK uh, funded work uh, since 2006. But the Wellcome Trust, I think, were dis disappointed to learn that even though they have been generously funding for article processing charges uh, since around that time, that their compliance is only just above the 50% mark. And there seems no good reason for that not to have been 100% for Wellcome Trust funded work. Now, of course, they've turned around and said, we're going to have a much stricter form of compliance. They're going to withhold money. And now they have the attention of the academic community. So I think then similar sorts of uh, sticks may well be needed. I would encourage the research councils to wield them. I do detect sometimes a little bit of shyness. They maybe don't like to throw their weight around, but in my experience, they're quite happy research councils to do things that academics don't like. So not fund their grants for one thing. Uh, blacklist them if you're an EPSRC applicant and you uh, fall foul of their three strikes rule, etc., uh, etc. Et I'm not a big fan of Welcome Trust Senior Investigator uh, policy and lack of project grants either, uh, just to spread the herd around. Um, so, but uh, as we've seen, uh, compliance mechanisms, they're still being worked out. I know there were meetings at RCK uh, only this week, but I think uh, I would, I would uh, wish more power to your elbow, uh, if I might put it in that way. So we had uh, Dan Dennett's report as well, and I think, uh, you know, it's many good things, and I think it was very interesting to hear uh, the context and background uh, to the discussions that they had to try and meet their remit. I think it's quite right that inevitably it's a compromised document because there are so many players uh, around the table. Uh, but there's been a lot of discussion afterwards, and uh, I think there was within the academic community and I guess within the open access uh, groupings within that, then there was some disappointment that more weight was not given to the role of repositories. Clearly, uh, there was an identified role for the PhD thesis and the gray literature, but. Uh, some people who championed uh, green open access were disappointed that that work hadn't been acknowledged because fully, at the moment, uh, for UK research, 35% of it had been published in open access through the green uh, route. And I think uh, it's I think it's good that the ERC UK policy has actually come out and is a um, uh, a greener shade, shall we say, uh, than than the impression that I got from the uh, from the report document itself. So uh, we've got clarification of that, so many thanks to Mark, and, uh, and kudos to Mark for turning into a blogger, so all the best people are bloggers now. Um, uh, has spelled out the policy on his 
website, on the RCK website, and I think actually that's a very interesting and useful channel for communication. So uh, the only task now is to persuade Dave Bullets uh, to start a blog as well, so that uh, we can perhaps widen the channels of communication as well. So the policy is quite clear, Mark's uh, given a very good account of it. There's a strong preference for gold and for CCBY, but green is definitely allowed, and I would like to see people embracing that and both options, whatever works for you, I would really like to take a pragmatic view and certainly in conversation with Mark and I think from his presentation we can also detect a, a very pragmatic stance on how this is going to work. I think we all understand that it's in our interest and it's in the wider interest of the economics of the United Kingdom and other countries around the world that we do this. So in terms of rationale, I mean, uh, he didn't quite say it today, Mark, but he had said it in period about uh, gold being uh, basically a sort of stamp of approval, so the publisher's version being the version of record, as it were. Now, he was careful to make it clear that what's deposited in the repository uh, should be the final peer-reviewed uh, article. And I think uh, that there was a feeling, I think, in the way that it's been put across, is that perhaps members of the general public wouldn't really understand that what they come across in a green repository would be essentially the same thing as what's published or what appeared on the publisher's website. And I think that underestimates the intelligence of the public, but also then the ease with which it's possible to put a, a headline on the deposited manuscript which says this is identical to what appears on this web link. So I think um, there was an article actually an insight by Martin Hall, I think from Salford, which was uh, claiming that the green repositories are only for preprints, you know, and which is of course uh, a model that's operated by some repository, on things of the archive, uh, but that's not what most people I think understand by uh, the role of a green repository. So funding, again, of course, that's only been worked out now. We had the announcement last Thursday from Mark, and uh, there's a scaled target to 75%. I think it would be good to have, again, I think Mark's going to do it, but it would be good to have more exposition as to the thinking behind that, and what that actually means, because I read a 75% target in five years' time as perhaps an indication of a of a target itself, and that, that was the extent of the ambition rather than going for 100%. So uh, I think uh, for the <coughs> academic community certainly it would be good to make sure that there's opportunities for that to be uh, clarified further and spelled out. And okay, they're only paying 80%. This is what we need. Full economic costing, this was the model we were sold uh, several years ago. It's going to start out at 80%, I was told, and then it would be ramped up to 100%. So, uh, just ask the research councils to go back to their dictionary and check what the word, word full actually means. Because <laughs> I think it means 100%. <laughs> okay, now, having slammed everybody else, uh, I have to say that you know, we need to beat ourselves up uh, because we academics, we researchers, we are uh, just as big a part of the problem as everybody else. So we are ill informed and rather conservative, small c, uh, in our outlook on life many ways, unfortunately. So too few of us, and I would certainly have been in this camp myself uh, 12 months ago, are aware properly of their obligations. I think good compliance policies are necessary and for that. Many people don't know uh, how open access works, or even what it means They're, they they do fall into this myth of assuming that open access equates with low quality. And uh, those of us that think open access is a good thing need to counter that view. I think actually the uptake that I've seen this year among my colleagues in terms of publishing in PLOS One has been uh, incredibly encouraging. I published my first paper in PLOS One back in June, uh, and the number of people I've met who's told me that you know this year they've also done, you know, that's the first time they've done it. And one only has to look at the rates of publication in PLOS One. They're now up to, I met uh, uh, one of the people in PLOS One back at a conference on Monday, and they've got 4,000 submissions a month. So they, they are huge. And uh, I imagine that their growth rate will slow down eventually, but it's still mightily impressive. And if you listen to really the four this morning the, on the Today program, there was a news piece about a paper uh, which was published in PLOS One. So it sort of nails the lie that you have to be in a high impact journal to, to do research that's of broad interest in the general public. 
we've been ignorant of subscription costs, so, uh, and I think, I don't know, I think certainly librarians can maybe do a bit more to publicize this to their academics, because as far as I'm concerned, you know, the library is a bit like the NHS, it's free at the point of use, so I just don't think about the cost, I, I pay for it as a taxpayer, but I don't really think about the, uh, what it actually costs. And that's one of the good things, I think, of moving to a gold model of APC, is that it will make the costs uh, much more visible to the people who really should be taking costs into their decision making. Uh, many don't really see an access problem if they're in you know, a wealthy institution like Imperial, where I work, where it's, it's, I do occasionally come across a journal I need to find that we don't have a subscription to. And uh, these days I go straight onto Twitter with the hashtag ICANN has PDF, it works extremely well. Uh, so, so no additional subscriptions necessary. Okay, I've got one minute, so I'll be done. Um, so many concerns for scientific societies and humanities, particularly I'm very much aware that I'm a life scientist and I don't really have a good perspective on that. And I've certainly heard many concerns about humanities researchers where the level of funding is less, and the relative cost of publishing uh, in their activity uh, is much higher. Weak sense of public duty, I sense that in some of my colleagues, but I would charge all publicly funded scientists to be accountable uh, to the taxpayer, not just in terms of the research that they do, but in terms of giving value for money. And then, of course, there's fear of losing an established model. We depend on publication in certain journals for career advancement, for grant funding. We might have invented the World Wide Web, but we remain uh, very suspicious of it. Some, uh, some research fields, they don't like the idea of publishing things only online. If it's not published on a piece of paper, somehow it, it loses value. And of course, we are just hopelessly addicted to the impact factors. And this is a real, a real problem um, for us. And I would love to kill them. Many people, uh, in the academic community agree with me, but we are like crack addicts, okay? We know it's bad for us. We know it does incredible harm. We know it's expensive. Uh, it causes huge amounts of stress. It's unfair, but we cannot help ourselves. So I wrote this uh, tirade back in the summer, uh, and actually it got an astonishing response, uh, mainly I think from the academic community, many of whom feel the pain too, but also feel the addiction and find it difficult to shake, shake it off for themselves. And I think we need some leadership in the academic community in order to get rid of this, because it would not be fair at all to place the burden of risk on junior researchers, many of whom are more open, I think, to the idea of publishing open access, because they've grown up with the internet. But obviously, many of them sense that they, there's, no, there's no chance that they'll get a, a permanent job unless they hit the you know, nature of science or cell or whatever in their uh, CV. And that's a big mistake and that we have to find ways to do that. Now there are interesting movements, so Wellcome Trust actually built into their open access policy. And I think this is a really good idea, and I'd like Mark to take this message back to RCUK, is to put in explicit statements like this that they will disavow the use of journal impact factors in any assessment of grants or fellowships or career advancements. I would like every university to explicitly disavow the use of these and to introduce more intelligent mechanisms. Many of them already have, but it's probably being done. So it would be good to hear about that and get some best practice uh, publicized and shared around. There are interesting new developments in old metrics. Many people still looking at them slightly quizzically, with slightly with a degree of mistrust. Uh, for some, they blithely assume that it's, you know, how many Facebook likes did your paper get, and that's not really a terribly meaningful measure of anything. But there are some, you know, if you're counting downloads and looking at activity, looking at, you know, groups within Mendeley, for example, who's downloading the paper, who's talking about it, then I think there is some meaning and substance in that. No substitute at the end of the day for reading the bleeding paper. <laughs> so, uh, it's happening. Uh, I don't think it's uh, stoppable. Uh, I, the, the statistics are looking promising. So worldwide, uh, we're up to 17%. Uh, in gold APC in the UK, I don't quite know why we're so, so down. I think it's just to do with culture and perceptions, the different types of activity. But overall, we have about 40% uh, open access publications. So we've made good progress even without strong compliance policies. And I think 
better compliance and we will do that much better. So my final slide really was just to sort of try and identify the issues we would like to maybe talk about a little bit further. Maybe things you can help with is getting the message out to academics, okay? I can do, do a bit, but uh, I think librarians also perhaps can help to uh, get the message out to instruct uh, academics on how it works, make it easy for them uh, to find out that information. Uh, there's a broad church of open access. Uh, Mark's well familiar with the evangelical wing. <laughs> I'll say no more than that, because you exactly know what I'm talking about. Uh, a real crucial point, like I think many libraries are going to be involved in working out how these APC charges are paid, and I am desperate that those mechanisms are visible to researchers, and not necessarily visible, that the researchers are also involved. And it's not just that you call one or two academics onto the committee, but every researcher, when they're making decisions about where to publish, that they know the costs and uh, are involved in, you know, is it worth paying the gold APC in this case, or is there a green route that will serve, and uh, thinking about the value for money for that. Because that's important for making sure that we have an active and functioning market in terms of uh, publishing outlets. At the minute, we have a market that's crippled by confidentiality, and only if we, the only way to drive down the costs uh, and get the cost of publication under control will be to have a market that works. We always have to work it out for all fields. The, the sciences, I think, you know, we're in good shape, but the humanities, uh, that obviously needs uh, more work. The compliance enforcement, again, obviously something that's under discussion, but we've got to make sure that that works, not just for gold open access, but of course for green, and I'm reassured by conversation with Mark that research councils are going to be uh, monitoring that as well. Market innovations from new and established publishers. Openness on profits and taxes, there's a challenge for them. Uh, you know, they like to pretend that they're you know, partners. Okay, that's the line that they will trot out, but you know, it's, 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 bit, it's partners, but it feels like sometimes it's partners you know, with the mob. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's a bit like, you know, you've seen, all seen the, the scene in the film, you know, where uh, the, the mafia boss is about to bump off somebody who's been a lifelong friend, and he says, you know, it's nothing personal, it's just business. <laughs> so that's a little bit how it feels sometimes. I'd like it to be a bit friendlier, okay, so, uh, from, the, from the wings of the publishing industry who haven't yet um, embraced um, open access to their bosom. Uh, the duration and cost of transition, well, it's a big question mark, and I don't think anybody in this room, which notably contains Dame Diana Finch, knows the answer to that question. So that's something uh, that we have to see. Interesting, I think there's a good move from RCUK that they will be recording how the money is spent and publishing that. And so that, that's a very important move to make to ease the transition and the shift of subscription funds to pay for uh, open access. International cooperation on open access policy. You know, many will be aware that the UK's uh, emphasis on gold is a distinct policy from other countries, so Belgium and Ireland both recently published open access policies that were uh, very much green rather than gold. You were allowed to go gold if you wanted to and if you could find the money for it, but green was the only uh, compliant uh, uh, target that they were setting. But there is a discussion to be had. Other countries, uh, I gather, are uh, thinking on, on all gold lines. But I'd like to know a little bit more from David Willits, for example, as to how those conversations are happening at an international level. So that's my five minutes right down. So I'm done, and I will thank you for your attention. <laughs>